Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest that you cannot see as usual because of our issues with Skype, but Willie Soon, Dr. Willie Soon from the Center for Astrophysics uh, at Harvard and the Smithsonian is joining us today. Willie, I got to let you know, you're one of my big heroes as far as climate science and the sun is concerned. And the more I learn about your research, the more impressed I get. You basically have rewritten the book on solar science. And what I mean by that is you have taken the deep dive into the historical records to actually find out these sunspot records as accurate as possible. And I applaud you for that. Uh, welcome to the show. How are you doing? All right, David. Thank you. And uh, I think I have already benefited from you over this many years, even though this is the very first time that we get to talk. Uh, since you always been recommending a lot of people and all to my talk at the Doctor for Disaster Preparedness, which is my favorite uh, meeting, I don't I don't get a chance to talk too much, obviously. But uh, so when I speak, I'm not supposed to talk to myself. <laughs> it's not a very good habit. Uh, since I really put in a lot of uh, energy and uh, to bring forth some new dimension and new ideas and new concept on all the works that I've been struggling to, to do, to achieve. Indeed, I, I really come very long and far and very proud to say that I think I've done quite a few very, very interesting things that will be very long lasting. That in the sense that these are all very, very beautiful piece of work and, and series of work actually over some 32 years now, if you count the, the years that I've been really struggling to understand actually how the sun affects the earth climate system. And of course, you always have to start something very uh, mundane and very, what you call, st stupid point of view. So you, I start very, very naively actually. And then as you dig deeper and deeper, you realize that, you know, just about, <laughs> just about quite a few things are related to each other. So you almost incomplete to say that you want to study last five years in terms of my latest thinking is that I felt it's inevitable that when you speak of sun earth connection you have to speak in terms of climatic tectonic and magmatic in the sense that it will have to involve the volcano it have to involve the earthquakes it has to involve a lot of other dimensions that seemingly not quite uh, difficult to make a connection of and and of course never mind the extra point of view of how the earth system and earth moon system of course evolve in the solar system and then the whole solar system evolve in terms of our perspective of the whole galaxies and so on and so forth so it is a very i guess you can see when i say i want to study something i don't pick the simplest point of view i try to be as comprehensive as I can to the point where I really find that a lot of those textbook, especially those that presented by IPCC and all those somewhat <laughs> arrogant uh, professors and scientists in all our ivory towers in all those universities, they are really talking trash in my humble opinion. And I really dislike their attempt to try to treat everybody like fool and, and just simply saying, oh, it's too complicated. You won't understand the mathematics, this and that. My God, there's not much mathematics in what you do, excuse me. So please enlighten me if you have, if you know any mathematics. These are the kind of things that it's almost to the point where these people are so arrogant that they are actually crouching on bullying people. It is a, a form of terrorism, it's a form of uh, technocracy, it's a form of those things that are very distasteful for me. We are just fellow human beings, fellow traveler in this, in this planet Earth and we all love the environment, we love to, to have a beautiful earth, we love to have, no one is waking up to try to say that, oh, the best idea today. I <laughs> oh, man. You know? just, yeah. <laughs> and then, this is the kind of accusation, it's flying left and right, you know, I've been in this thing for a long time, that's why immediately I want to cut to the chase. Excuse me. You have neither moral, nor ethical, nor any other thing that you can speak to me in such tone. So step back and then watch what we have to say. Please don't play this kind of arrogant nonsense and stop it. And let's talk about science if you want to understand science. 
I will tell you what I know. I will tell you what I don't know, obviously. And there are plenty of things that I don't know, obviously. Yes. In, in, in any case, <laughs> let me let me hear what you have to say and what sort of questions you want to know yeah, and ask. Yeah, well, I mean, just in the last decade, with all the propaganda we have from the IPCC, um, mm -hmm. we have breakthroughs in climate science with the work of Heinrich Spensmark and the cloud uh, experiment. We have Niv Shavir uh, uh, connecting cosmic rays and spiral arms with long-term patterns on Earth. We have your work, which is on the, the shorter time scale. Uh, that is connecting all the historical sunspot data with, with grand minimas. And now we have machine learning that we can take this historical data and we can run it through and we can forecast into the future with potentially high resolution what is actually happening with the climate. Now, I find it most hilarious, Willie, that uh, the climate scientists themselves, the CO2ists, the people that say that uh, we're all burning up and it's our fault, uh, the most obvious fact that they don't believe the sun controls the climate when it's the most obvious elephant in the room to begin with. Now, <laughs> uh -huh. let's let's uh -huh. talk let's talk about the censorship real quick. And you were a big uh, you were a huge target uh, late in February of 2015. Greenpeace uh, attacked you, and they claimed in an uh, that you had uh, some conflicts of interest. The accusation was false, right. but but it was picked up by like the New York Times. I have the articles I'm showing them here. Uh, deeper ties to corporate cash for yep. doubt, doubtful climate researcher, and this information is still up on the it's internet. It's a Sunday front page. Yeah, it's it's still up on the internet. Five years later, they did not take it down. So, what are your thoughts about these types of attacks on scientists? Sure, and it's very very. Uh troublesome by the way this is exactly what science is not supposed to be they couldn't argue and they are somewhat i guess unhappy that's the kind phrase i can use or they are jealous at what i can do which means i'm a practicing scientist and i do as much science as i can without time without any limit without boundary without fear without prejudice i just simply examine topics so i write my scientific paper Publish in any peer review, you name it, right? Because the usual thing is that they always say, oh, all the skeptics or, or denier, they don't know how to publish paper. I just publish as much as I can, and it, it doesn't matter how many papers you publish. It's about how the content of the, any paper that you publish, does it, does it last or does it mean anything? I have to say that, in my humble opinion, 90% of the paper that are being published today in quote unquote climate science area should not have been published in the first place. So, you know, just shame on all of them, right? And I'm as confident as I can say that mine belongs to the other 10%, not that 90% that, that those guys are frequently publishing, where they can keep claiming that they have how many citations. These are all mutual admiration club. It's just nothing about science. And in terms of this attack on scientists, I have to say that, of course, I am the biggest target but they have come so far that they attack just about anyone that is not following their narrative. Okay? People including Professor Richard Lindzen, which I consider the most brilliant meteorologist and climate scientist that we ever had, ever. Yeah, I agree. The youngest person ever elected to the National Academy of Science because he solved one of the fundamental problems on the moon on lunar tide in the 80s and uh, late 70s, okay? And even that age, that record was not broken by Feynman, which is the most well-known physicist you know of all time. But even Lick Linzen, little known guy, break Feynman's uh, little barrier. <laughs> and then they attack Professor Will Harper, a professor at Princeton of physics, who is the inventor of this, uh, what you call uh, 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 atmospheric waveguard system for adaptive optic system, which means the atmosphere is full of turbulence, so if you want to see the, the stars and all that in a clear way, or even the sun, those systems are constantly being used. Amazing. In a deep understanding of the atmosphere, to know how to correct for the turbulence and the wavefront in the real time. And that is one hell of an achievement. But that's just a tiny little part that he has done. He has contributed so much more. 
in spectrum in, in imaging system so on and so forth they attack him calling him a denier calling him doesn't understand physics of co2 my god please <laughs> to touch on those things okay this is really showing you how out of depth a lot of this all of this real nonsense by the way i haven't known a single person from their side that would be able to claim any understanding of the CO2 molecule as much as Professor Will Harper. Yeah. Because he is a spectroscopist. He is an experiment. Along. And he had done all of this work. And when he says something, it means something. But these people come and attack him, calling him a denier and doesn't understand what <laughs> CO2 greenhouse effect is all about. Yeah. This is quite an embarrassment for the for the field of climate science. So I'm so glad that I don't belong there, by the way. I don't call myself any climate scientist or anything. I'm just a scientist that I study everything in general. And they attack us. They attack all of us. And then one of the supposedly effective scheme is to tie us to some money interests. This is actually, if anybody know anything about the standard strategy of argument, it's clearly a projection. It's a standard, uh, what you call Saul Alinsky technique. They just put what they are most fear of on you to make you look as bad as possible. I I have to say that from their experiment, from their attempt over 30 years, they've done a good job. I would be able to, I, I really hope to, to, to provide a very nice report that myself and my great colleagues from my two great Irish colleagues, these are God's send. Ronan and Michael Connolly. We have worked very hard now for almost like five years together. But in our spare time, we still produce a report on the underlying uh, 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 philosophy and working of Greenpeace, who is actually treat me as their number one target. They are the one that, by the way, the attack piece on me in 2015 is not New York Times effort at all. It's just basically Greenpeace has been really, really trying to come after me using Freedom and Information at constantly harassing my workplace, constantly trying to get my emails and so on and so forth. And they succeed. That's insane. Story to their benefit. And then they essentially wrote that piece and then pass it on to New York Times. So New York Times stands. So it's a Greenpeace New York Times collaboration. So that's why it's important to say that <laughs> if you ask yourself, you all know also Greenpeace. Another person that you should interview is uh, Patrick Moore, which is a great friend of mine, right? He's a uh, one of the co-founders of Greenpeace. So he's Patrick now Moore he's now a denier. Patrick, he's now a joined, denier like us. Yeah, yeah. He's also called denial. He he just simply was not agreeing with the the crazy anti-human, anti-science, anti you know humanity kind of philosophy that Greenpeace uh, later leadership when they grow bigger and bigger, right? They expand so much that. Do you want to know that they have close to half a billion dollars of cash? This is the kind of business operation that they are running. They are not little baby. They got offices here and there. The power of, of that kind of money and mostly from, I would say, extortion money, basically. This is yeah. the way that they do things, right? They extort all the big commercial, big company, Coca-Cola, anything you name. <laughs> Damn it. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to advertise all your problem from yeah. microplastic to anything. This is the way they function. So I want to. And uh, Willie. unfortunately, they are, couldn't be far more than wrong, obviously. Anyway. All right, Willie, you were just breaking up a little. So we turned your video off, which uh, I was the only one that could see you anyway. And and what we see is this egregious uh, attacks on actual scientists and it all has to do with political agendas. So could you talk just real quick about the fact that all of the money funders and all of the science is being paid for the po by the policy makers and they're pushing this green agenda, which I just did a talk uh, last weekend at the Crestone Energy Fair and I revealed uh, the dirty nature of the green energy agenda to uh, a pretty granola type of a group of people, some hippies. And they were astounded by the types of waste products and the fact that they're actually the green movement is destroying the earth faster than the oil and gas industry ever could. Could you talk a little bit to that? Uh, yes, uh, it, it, this is the, the constant, constant uh, myth 
that they say that the oil companies and coal company, all these guys are, are funding us so much. In fact, <laughs> they are completely stolen by, by the green movement, right? The fake green movement who I, I really felt that they have stolen everything from us in some sense because we are the true environmentalists. As far as I can tell, you are a very interesting fellow. This is, I see the way you live, the way you, you created this ranch project and then all your stuff is about self-sustained farming, that sort of thing. It's a very positive thing that we have to try to keep doing that. And and they are the one that rob all this thing. They are the one that is not green. They are the one that want to continue to use the diesel on their rainbow warriors and so on and so forth. Got caught, of course, because they have to put out a face, Greenpeace, right? And it is the oil company that is funding them. Think about the Stanford funding that, that Shell or, or BP are giving to them. Those are over. We're not talking about little two million, three million dollars. We're talking about hundred million kind of money. They are really being funded at big time by all the fossil fuel company. Essentially, they took everything over. So these are all something that, in fact, my good colleague from Australia, Joe Nova, has published a report long ago, and I would say that's already 10 years ago, 20, 2009, I believe, in, in during the Copenhagen big meeting. And uh, she showed very clearly that, I mean, it is it is them, the, the environmentalists and the IPCC movement and all those guys who, who got huge, huge amount of money from fossil fuel company. We are basically taking any crumb that anyone wants to give us. For me, it doesn't matter if it's a Greenpeace giving me money or if it's anybody, as long as they don't tell me what to do. I am all free agent because I need all the money. I, I have so little money that I have to say that sometimes no wonder people thought that it is a joke that I'm living on the poverty level. Yes, I am, but I, well, so what? It's my private choice. I'm, I love science. I'm in science, not for money. That is the truth. And uh, and people were joking around, oh, that, that I could even work in the McDonald's. Yeah, that's sometimes <laughs> there are many moments in my, many years in my income tax that I'm being paid at that level. So who it is that is really being dishonest and stealing money? But set that aside. They are very aggressive, but we all know that it is a strategy. It is a form of coercion. It's a form of strategy that they've been putting on, on all of us. The only thing now is that can save us is actually by communicating among ourselves and tell nothing but the truth. This is the problem. And and many people have not heard of Willie Soon in the sense that they they read, they Google the internet, the Wikipedia is completely wrong. Most of the information, I wouldn't bother to correct them because I'm also anti-Wiki, put it this way. I'm not gonna help them to correct anything because these are the movement that doesn't stand up to anything that is meaningful to me. So I can easily start my own movement. Why do I need Wikipedia? Really, I'm as confident as that because all I need is a bit of time, actually. Uh, that is why I'm freely now to go anything that I want to pursue, I'll pursue myself. That's just, I don't trust the system anymore. The system is highly corrupted. Everybody is all seems to be working for the next paycheck. That is just a ridiculous way to live. I don't live that way, so I apologize. I, <laughs> I don't listen to nobody except my own thinking, my own, my own ability. To, to try to think about this world in a very rational way, in in some sense a scientific way in which I can apply any tools that I know how to use to study the the, the wonder of nature as I as I see it. I mean, and of course, the, the most important thing about being a scientist is to be able to admit that you're wrong or you're in the wrong direction. I'm just been blessed that I've been very careful in every inch and every step that I that I take that I want to make sure, and I'm, I'm very good in not lying to myself. That's another thing <laughs> that you have to be very cautious of. That just because you believe in something doesn't mean that nature is actually following what, you, what you're thinking. You know, you can really claim all you want about the sun affect the climate system, but you have no way of, if you have no way of understanding how it does it exactly, I think it's still a very, uh, like a moonshot, it's just a very dangerous proposition. So one has to be very, very careful but I, I have to say, I'm confident to tell people that as far as I'm concerned, this is almost a very settled problem in a sense. But there's a lot of uh, gaps and holes in knowledge about uh, how actually that we can actually offer the next level of understanding, which I'm working day in, day and night to try to get to the next stage. And by now, after 32 years of working, I really felt that we're in very, very good uh, uh, stage of understanding and good progress. Except, except, there's still a cautionary remark because you can see every step of the way. By the way, we're going to have a fun thing going to come out in a day or two or tomorrow. 
is this so-called fact checkers, right? From Facebook and <laughs> Climate Feedback, one of those new entities that those guys created because they want to silence all of us. So yeah. anytime any newspaper come up with some article positive on us, like one article by the Epoch Time, a friend named Alex Newman wrote an article explaining our new paper on Sun Climate Review. And then he's really acting as a journalist. He's quoting us accurately. And then he's quoting also uh, checking with IPCC and, and NASA Goddard Gate Institute director, Govin Schmidt, and asking them their view on our paper. And then get both sides and he print them. And then now they are so clever, this climate feedback, this fact checker. We are gonna we're gonna fact check the fact checker themselves. We're gonna try to show how ridiculous now this whole business of of strategy of theirs. But this is another strategy, by the way, because they want to act like they're a very nice guy, they have this expert, this and that, and then they can debunk really soon. Just like that. Oh my god, I love to see that. By the way. I, I, David, I swear in the name of science and God and my whatever conscience that I have that if I'm wrong, oh my God, I would just admit I'm so wrong. I'm a stupid little bastard that I can't figure this thing out. <laughs> that I, I was lying to everybody. These people really are that low standard. This is the problem. They have no standard. They have no standard. And then they keep projecting, projecting that, that people are doing weak work. Oh. Why are they so afraid? By the way, we never get a debate with them properly. We yeah. keep calling for debate years after years after years. They always want to pick the worst one. Actually, they always pick the, the work spokesperson. This is why they never want to debate with Willie Soon. I don't care about you pick any other people that actually not so well trained in science, in my humble opinion, because these people go up there. They may be a very good speaker like Mark Morano. They are really good. Speakers. I, I love Mark Morano, for example, a lot of my friends, right? They are very good speaker. But ultimately, they are still not practicing scientists. So they haven't been doing the real <laughs> groundwork like you know you're talking about digging hole baby i dig so deep man i'm halfway through the earth now <laughs> three thousand <laughs> kilometers at least uh, what are you guys talking about man you want to talk about science let's talk science let's go yeah and this is the problem i couldn't get one proper discussion with them and they always do this kind of stunt so the fact checker will be checked very soon and we're gonna demonstrate to the world that oh come on this guy is a sick joke you guys yeah. please you know, but they have money. That's the problem. They have money to keep, keep spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. Our problem now is exposure. So I, I'm very grateful. The reason why I want to do this, actually, I, I just told a friend of mine, I don't want to talk for a few months and see. But uh, I, I just take you all because I really like you. I, I, I really want to keep quiet because I don't like to talk too much. But when I talk, I really want to talk. I want to tell the whole story. These people are lying, cheating, and not even competent as a scientist. And they want to keep playing game like this. Oh, please, go go to the back of the room and keep quiet. Keep no. quiet and then uh, I'll give you a test later. <laughs> These people really don't know what they're talking Indeed, I really tell you, I actually can tell a lot of them that one of the most famous uh, spokesperson from their side is Catherine Hayhoe. This is a very strange professor. Claimed to be some climate scientist, but I don't remember, recall she ever done any proper climate. And of course, they are professor this and professor that, but they're not professor in climate science. They're professor in political science. In, in one of these Texas Christian University or whatever, one of those. And yeah. she doesn't even, all she ever do, I even know her PhD work, was just to take some computer models and then they call it nested grid. They, they, they can do regional forecast and regional climate. These people are really somewhat a sick joke, actually. They are not very strong scientists. They have barely minimal understanding of something. Of course, they're clever. They're clever because they know how to get through the academic system and the ladder. In fact, they're the smart one, actually. I'm the stupid yeah. one. I'm the one that without any titles, without any uh, accolade or things like that. But I, why do I care? None of that. That don't mean any deep, anything deep for science. I'm very interested in science. I want only science. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and then we figure out the rest of it from there. Humanity can really do a whole lot more. If people are a little bit kinder, a little bit calmer, a little bit more rational, actually, and a little bit less strategic, a little bit more uh, trust humanity, actually, trust your neighbor, trust a fellow human being. But this is the kind of world that I wouldn't allow them to, to, to trap us in. So I, I would not want to really play too much of this nonsense with them. That's why I don't have time to, to play baby game at, because I did play all of that, David. I won yeah. once in my career, and by 2004, I decided I quit all of that. 
<laughs> Screw yeah. all of you. I'm not going to buy to go and steal money from myself, which means taxpayer funded uh, kind of research. They call it government funding. That's not government funding. It's our taxpayer funding this. It's not paid by Joe Biden, excuse me. Uh, it's paid by my pocket. Okay. Gavin Schmidt, just remember, always remember, you work for NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study. That's a government agency. And uh, that's pay paid by me. That's why I'm uh, paying your paycheck. So shut up. And don't come and debate really soon and don't keep telling people that my word is not worth looking. But that's your job. You are being paid to do that. On the other hand, <laughs> I work very hard to earn my, my income and uh, through any donation that anybody wants to give me. Not through the kind of uh, stealing that you're doing. Well, Willie, we appreciate you for who Willie. you are as a human. And more importantly, you're invited to come up to the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and bring your family if you ever need to and stay here and be part of the sustainable community we're developing here. Now, my background is I'm a scientist and my partner's a scientist, and we opted out of this society because of what we saw over the last 15 years. I had uh, gotten into work as an activist. My degrees, I have a master's uh -huh. degree in geology. I'm a paleoclimatologist, and I worked in catastrophic geology back in the 80s and 90s, and, and they simply wouldn't uh -huh. fund fund our work because it didn't go along with the narrative but it was real science we did real field field work and all of the studies we did had real results that showed that climate is episodic cyclic uh there is huge amounts of natural yeah. climate variability at huge time scales and now we're just able to to hone that in even closer and closer with the work you're doing on the sun so Let's close right. up the last 15 minutes of the video here and talk about some of your recent work, especially the machine learning reconstruction. That's what we'll end with. Um, but first, we, you did touch on this paper, how the sun has influenced the northern hemisphere temperature trends, an ongoing debate. Um, and so were you basically just trashed for this work? Uh, because there's at least a, a dozen scientists that are on the abstract here. Uh, tell us a little bit about the paper. Sure. This is a paper that's been, uh, it's an invited review by the most prestigious uh, solar physicist from China, uh, Professor Wang Qingxiu, who invited me about some few years, five years back at least. I was just busy to respond to this request. So myself and uh, Ronan Connolly and Michael Connolly, so we wrote up the paper, and then we opened up the paper for, for co-authors to to sign on and to, to add their point of views and because we want it to be very, very comprehensive. In fact, we would invite the IPCC folks, but of course they never would participate, isn't it? And we we actually wrote this paper. It has 24 co-authors and it comes from Germany, from uh, Argentina, from China, from, you know, what have you, all over the world. And all of them are very, uh, what you call, distinguished uh, scientists that all by themselves. But we were able to put up this review paper by asking two simple questions. If you want to study sun climate connection, don't you think that you should know what is the correct metric to study, like the thermometer temperature station? What is the th best thermometer uh, record that we can use? And the second question is, if you want to study how the sun affects you, what is the best sun irradiance record that you should use? So. Without prejudice, because certainly that we allow everybody to have their view in this paper. So we wrote it in a way in which that no one picks side. At least you can state your opinion, but then we want to open the discussion, including IPCC point of view, by the way. So we show IPCC point of view, which take the thermometer data station that claim that all the urban station could be included, all those thermometer record that is contaminated by other factors like tree growing around the, 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 the thermometer station, all this floor product or, or urbanization over time, you know, in places like Tucson, Phoenix, and so on and so forth, right? And we show IPCC point of view, which clearly are using a thermometer record that we don't prefer to use. So we just say, why don't we look at the, all the rural station as a first cut? By the way, we have a lot more work to do to demonstrate. In fact, for the U.S. thermometer station, we know how to now quantify the amount of uh, what you call uh, uh, non-climatic effects, which means you should have a record that you should actually interpret and can be studied how climate varies, isn't it? So yeah. we prefer this, uh, what you call clean station record, but from rural station and then study. It turns out that the IPCC chosen record 
has only strict warming, okay? Strict warming because it's contaminated by all these other factors that have nothing to do with CO2 in the first place. And then they use that to interpret CO2 because they put CO2 into their model and then try to force it to agree. And then it looks like it's agreeing. So we clap hand, right? Come on, guys, give an audience, give them a super clap hand and we agree. <laughs> IPCC is so smart that they solve a problem. They, they just found themselves inside the finger, their own face inside the thermometer record. Good for you, good for you. Then we, on the other hand, we, many of us in the in the in this group, this this authorship, agree that we should study a thermometer that is from rural station, and it's already clear, even for 150 years kind of record, that the temperature record seems to be more cyclical. It is varies, you know, and change up and down over time in large amplitude, and then. We also select, we, we pick a particular irradiance record. Okay. Again, I emphasize that I pick because the problem of the irradiance record, how it changes over time, it is a very difficult class of problem. And I'll explain next, of course, in the, my, 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 my struggle in the sunspot activity study. It's all related to sunspot and other features on the sun. But this record, we can show that you don't need any damn CO2. It can fit this natural variability, this class of a thermometer record, and they fit it. And then people now want to pre present us as some kind of bias, uh, think that we, we are wrong, uh, we, we, uh, we, we want, but the point is that the paper was saying that we are open for discussion. We want to invite IPCC. Can you account for the fact that you are using the wrong record? And if our record is wrong and you don't like this, can you tell me what's wrong with this? This is the kind of a, proper scientific way to do things. That's how we do it, this way, okay? So when, when this thing are, are reported, by the way, they're not that major newspaper reported on this. So Epoch Times reported this. It got a lot of attention. By the way, one other thing that would make them furious is I want to tell you that our paper available for free. I don't have money to pay for this thing, but my colleagues at China was willing to, to, to say that this paper can be, uh, what do you call, uh, open access, so they are allowed to read this for free. And now we have, today we have almost 9,353 downloads. I'm very proud to say for a science paper within two weeks that you got 9,000 people downloading the PDF file to want to read a uh, almost 60 pages paper with 520 references. I That's mean, these lot. are really a very serious and nice review work. So, put it this way, we left it open. I have my personal view, of course. I prefer this view that because I know there's no flaw in this thinking, that you pick the best sunspot uh, thermometer record, and then you pick the best irradiance record, okay? And then it, it really fits. So therefore, it's really, if, if people would be worried about CO2, should actually try to explain this away, if they can. In fact, they never bother. They just keep saying that Willie Soon is wrong, you know what they did? They always take the irradiance record that have no change. Those are political results, by the way. And then they put the, their, their standard thermometer record. Lulu, Willie really soon is wrong again. This is how childish this kind of thing. This is what we're trying to do to correct all these fact checkers. <laughs> they actually just make the point that we made. And you guys are selective and you are biased. And then we say that IPCC was selective and biased. In fact, these are the kindest word you can use. In fact, the proper scientific words and we use those words. And these people are highly unhappy. Oh, no, 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 it's not possible. By the way, that's a very cute part of this story. So when Alex Newman asked this IPCC press secretary, they have a special press people, obviously they have a big press office. And they say, oh, uh, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately this paper was submitted and published in a time that passed the deadline of IPCC, where they say, oh, past certain time, we will not be able to look at this paper and, and uh, therefore it will not be counted. And then they say, but, but somehow they know that this paper will not change anything. Really? You know, they, they missed a very big point, by the way, when they, when they pointed this out, which I want to laugh. They didn't realize that they immediately tell the world that the IPCC report that just got released August 9th, it's called a, a, a six assessment record work, working group uh, one, which is the physical sciences, that they just told people in the world that they are already outdated. Because we provide just the most comprehensive sun climate ever written in this history, and they just say that they haven't included this. They just prove themselves that they are outdated. Yeah. And then they say, oh, I refuse to comment. And Gavin Schmidt's point of view is basically, this is a total nonsense that no one should waste any time on it. Excuse me, Gavin Schmidt, you are being paid to study this topic. So therefore, I think that somehow you should be held accountable for not, for not being able to, 
to, to put out the best thermometer record for people to study. You put in all the wrong record for people to study. You've been misleading uh, people for so long. So I think that the ball is in their court. Always. We always kick it back to their court. You know, don't send all your stinky stuff and dirty laundry here. Go back and clean your house. And then come back and talk to me when you want. I'm always ready. Yeah. So now yeah. let me move on because I think you have limited time. I want to move on now to the aspect of understanding the solar irradiance and solar activity in general. Yeah. It is a very difficult problem. Yeah. It's been collected. Sunspot is among the oldest continuous uh, available data sets in the history of science, of course. It started around 1609 and 1608, Galileo Galilei and a bunch of other, the earlier people, of course, Thomas Harriot and a bunch of people uh, uh, was aware of this thing. And they apply the first, the new invention of telescope. So they look to the heaven. They not only, Galileo is a smart guy, of course. First he looked at the moon, then he looked at the Jupiter's uh, 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 satellites, right? Where he realized that there's a solar system all by itself. So he changed his notebook from, from Italian to, to Latin. He realized that he has a major discovery. Boy, I got to put in a proper language. I don't know if you ever heard that story, but I gave a talk in, for DDP in, in Colorado once on this topic. Uh, so Galileo is a smart guy. He realized this is important stuff, dude. You know, that the, the sun actually is not a perfect sphere. As everybody imagined, there are these blotches of dark stuff appearing. And in the early days, uh, even Johannes Kepler, who's a very smart one, he actually don't believe that uh, this spot is, is intrinsic to the sun, meaning that it's just basically passing by object like Mercury and things like that. And, uh, and uh, Galileo is the one that very convinced of this particular model because he actually observed the sun day after day. This is the, this is the kind of, uh, what you call, insights, right, that, that he has, that maybe I should go out and watch again tomorrow. Oh, there I go watch again tomorrow. I watch again tomorrow and see where it goes. If you can see, they actually got carry over the other side. And then not only that, wait till another 14 days, it come around the other side because the sun turned around by itself about 27 days, right? Yeah. Anyway, so this record has been kept for a long time. And I, I'm very proud to tell you that we actually have another working paper now that is very close to being accepted. So let me combine the two papers in one now. The, the first paper that we already published in uh, Advances in Space Research, it's basically a work that apply the so-called consensus. Again, I don't like all those things, but uh, you know what? Sometimes you really have to go back to the basics. So we, we play the game. We use their consensus uh, sunspot record. Okay? And then we just ask ourselves that if we use this modern uh, technique of artificial intelligence, which has actually been progressing very rapidly because it's been applied to all class of problem. By the way, if you're interested in uh, wildfire, I should send you my wildfire talk too. We first applied this to wildfire record. It was very successful. We've got three manuscripts now that is being worked on and submitted. And then we next work on also earthquake. And then now, I told, I told my good friend, by the way, this work is really the brilliance of uh, my good friend from uh, University of uh, Mexico, right? The National Autonomous University of Mexico, which is their best school. Uh, this guy by the name of Victor Velasco Herrera. He's a very brilliant uh, physicist in some sense. And he is tuned to all these new methods, and I just simply tell Victor, why don't we try it on the sun, since it's so successful on wildfire. And boom, the first, uh, I like the word that you use, boom. It <laughs> does work. It does work quite well. We just pick about five, six skill. The key skill that is important was not only the 11 year sunspot cycle, it's actually the subharmonics, the 5.5 years. It illuminates not only the shape of the sunspot cycle, it, it shows, it contains a lot of information because we show the interplay of the 5.5 years and the 120 year cycle. And it really illuminate the whole class of problem. So with some of this skill that we pick, we show that we can recover all of its signal over the last 400 years. Then we ask ourselves, okay, can we make a forecast? Of course we can make a forecast. But in this first paper that we published, we actually provide the first most comprehensive study ever. You know what we are able to do? We are able to show that a certain period from 1730 to 1760, that we actually doing a hind casting, which means you already have the record, you hind cast, which means you go backward, you see whether, what can you see? And we actually hind casted much, slightly higher, quite a lot higher than, than what has been so-called so observed. 
by, by the sunspot observer over during that time. So the question, oh my God, you must be wrong, you must be crazy, all that stuff. No, 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 no. If you ask now the world best sunspot historian, like my good friend Douglas Hoyt, he now collaborate with us in this second paper, which I want to mention also because it is the most powerful paper that I think this planet has ever seen yet. I'm already confident that people from 2100 look back in 2021, if they find that year, who wrote the best sunspot uh, paper? This one. This one has to be the one. There's no way anybody yeah. can come even close. But let me explain the beauty of this paper. But the first paper is that we found that 1730 to 1760 should have a higher sunspot record. And then guess what? If you look around the sunspot historian and sunspot record recording, this time during the only during this time period that there's no more than 20 percent of the time that people watch the the, the sun. In contrast, the famous sunspot Mondo minimum from 1645 to 1715, over 80% of the sun time was watched. We don't see sunspot because it was no sun, there was no sunspot. Do you understand what I'm trying to talk about the significant? And this time is the one that happens to be the one that not viewed as much. So we happily to put out a second postulate, right? So, and by the way, uh, Hoy and myself, I'm always, I'm a really history buff myself. So. <laughs> We constantly look into the past and try to see what other information we can. It's, it is an information age. And it's amazing the amount of stuff that we can pull out, which show up in this second paper that we are writing now with Douglas Hoyt, which I have to say is the foremost sunspot historian of all time, of all time, really. And in this work, we study something called the group sunspot number. Sunspot, instead of counting this tiny little spot, right? Sometimes they come in very small sizes, actually, and they don't live very long. We want this thing called group sunspot that's slightly larger. A lot of them, of course, multiple times bigger than the size of the Earth, if you put it in a context. But we lose, we, Hoy is the one that introduced this, this idea that we should try to see whether we can go back in history, get the information on the group sunspot. So he started to introduce this concept called group sunspot number. The whole idea there is indeed is connected to the interest in irradiance and other properties that is much more uh, what you call continuous and long running. So, for example, you want to know the solar irradiance, right? It really cannot be disturbed by a lot of these spots. Like, you know, they, they only cover tiny, tiny portion of the sun surface area. So they're not as effective as a lot of this long lasting group stuff. So he introduced this group sunspot number and published in 95 to 98. And, and if people, again, want to accuse us for money, and all, well, I really want to take all of them and slap them uh, virtually, of course. And <laughs> Hoyt was being paid because no one wants to sponsor the work. Yeah, he paid at 25% of his paycheck. Okay? All of us are just true scientists. We don't really care. But sometimes when you're a kid, you really do have to take care of it. That's what my, my, my pleasure is actually to take care of my family, right? So I have to find some income. Okay? So I do have to work. And I ask anybody who wants to pay, actually. So I want to propose people that can afford to donate, go to my series-sign.com, which I'll send you the link already. Please donate any amount you want, $10, $20, anything will be enough for me to buy ink, buy paper, computer, whatever, all these things. It's fine. But the point is, he was paid at that but he produced the best work of all time. And then from 98, he kind of quasi-retired because there's no more money. And he sit there until now 2021, in some sense, I really soon woke him up. <laughs> hey, oh, Doc, because I only met him once in 1993 in Paris. We went to Observatoire de Paris. Both of us got invited, which is standing at the longitude, the zero longitude where we get to talk about sun and sunspots. That's such a nice place. And that's a that's the place of Giovanni uh, Cassini, who, who is uh, one of those astronomers who observed the sun during the Mondo Minimum, and he didn't see sunspot. So... <laughs> You can see he was saying, Galileo is messing around with us, man. We don't see no sunspot. What is he talking about? Yeah. Anyway, so we now study this group sunspot number. We use the same uh, algorithm to try to try to see whether we can see what pattern. And we actually produce a whole set of, of, of information. And this time, we not only start from 1700, we go all the way back to 1609. Now, we want to study the key concept of sunspot sunspot activity during the Mondo Minimum. We clearly show that the sunspot dynamos does not die off. 
it clearly was going there, but at a much lower level, but it's, it's operating. In fact, when we compare the estimated timing of this sunspot cycle with, let's say, <laughs> the one that we named the Monda Minimum after by Edward Monda and Annie Monda, and by the way, I wrote a, 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 a label of love books, quasi-popular books called the Monda Minimum on the, just to honor these two person solar science people who's just an amazing character. They, they work in Royal Greenwich Observatory. They study, they actually take a picture of the sun daily, dedicated for over 40 years at least. And, and, and really doing this for the sake of science, really. And when we compare our result for the Monda Minimum timing, of, of the cycles with the estimated, because Monda has the insight as early as 1920s already, that this sunspot cycle didn't appear and then he even estimated the timing, we agree. And then when we look at all these other postmodernist people that produce those results, from beryllium 10, we compare to them, they are not less impressive by the way. So I'm not saying either right or wrong, but we present all the results, that's the whole point. And then as a proud US citizen, I also want to report to your audience that in this paper, we are basically provide a strongest possible clue for rediscovering this lost, uh, what, you what you call the first sunspot drawing from colonial America. Yes. It's related to this, this character, yeah, by the name of Humphrey Marshall. Humphrey Marshall is a botanist from Philadelphia. Uh, not Philadelphia, uh, from, uh, yeah, state yeah, of Philadelphia. Pennsylvania. Not Philadelphia, but he's from one of those counties, Chester County. He's well-known uh, botanist, by the way. So there are names after him, there are society named after him. His flowers are used in uh, European uh, King's Garden, Louis the Fifteenth, I think, use, uh, use his, his, his garden. But during winter, he cannot do much botany, so he studies sunspot. <laughs> he actually watched sunspot, and he made drawings. And he gave this drawing to Benjamin Franklin, who is an other share in London, and present the thing in the Royal Society. And it was very nice. And then some years ago, my colleague Jose Vaquero reported that this sunspot uh, drawing was all this, uh, what do you call it, got lost. And then with a little persistence and a little curiosity, all I need was just asking around, checking around, who knows Humphrey Marshall the most. So I actually found a Quaker in Pennsylvania who actually personally took a project of uh, Humphrey Marshall, tried to reconstruct uh, Humphrey Marshall's life, so even draw his portrait, but of course it's a model. No one has his portrait. Just like no one know how John Harvard looked like, by the way. So the statue standing at the Harvard University is a fake. It's not a real Harvard. Nobody know how he looked like. So he yeah. essentially was telling me that he has seen the, the thing. So we have an eyewitness. Hallelujah, isn't it? So. I keep begging him now, please try to recover this thing and then, uh, you know, I don't want any credit, please. I'm just a busybody who wants to know, that's all. Now, at least for my own satisfaction that we know that this thing is not lost. So I'm very happy to report that in this paper, we, we have to tell this story, of course. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, who is Dillow? Will it soon? I'm not a historian, I'm not. But I'm studying, I'm studying, that's the whole point. And by the way, I have been sitting on Sunspot Record for a long time. I've been studying them for 31 years. This is only like the first two papers I ever published. You know why? I'm very conservative. When I publish something, I want to say that I want to have something truly unique that no one has ever seen in this world to say. This is what, if these people want to accuse me that I have so many papers, ah, please go away, sit back in the back again. Go to the back of the room and wait, wait in line. When I'm not so busy, I'll call you in. I mean, these people, I really have to tell, push them back because you know why? They're not good scientists. They are just so somehow insecurity or whatever, all this, all this crazy notion that they have in their head about science that is all wrong. So I, I simply are very happy to report to your audience that we work very hard. We make some progress. By the way, we make a lot more progress. This year is just amazing. I, with another colleague of mine from Argentina, I have to mention his name, is Rodolfo Gustavo Cianzo. This is one of the most brilliant dynamics. And I somehow people don't know them and I actually found one of his papers in 2012 when I, when I saw it. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not emotional, but I, I actually dropped on the floor. Gee, where is this guy coming from? I was so shocked that, that there's such a guy that is so good. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. He really figured out and showed the dynamics and how, how he essentially showed how the whole solar system can perturb the, the sun movement, right? And then show how the sun earth system and show every. He showed the point is that a lot of these people just talk. 
That's why I challenge this Gavin Schmidt who claimed that he knows uh, Newton dynamics. Show me how you integrate all these models. Show me. I mean, don't talk all this sweet talk to me about names and this and that. <coughs> Just show me. Science is all about that, really. It's about what you got, man. What do you know? Show me. But don't <laughs> talk all day long, man. It's not about finger pointing. It's about how, know, how you know how to calculate. What are you going to be able to calculate? Show me. Anyway, so and so and I have been working for almost uh, five, six years now. We produce a whole new series of uh, work. One of the work that I really must let your audience know, please, I go on a little bit. It's because I think we produce one of the best solution of this Sun-Earth orbital dynamics in the sense that we allow you to calculate the seasonal radiation correctly. The problem is the previous solution that was published, it was published in 1978 by Professor André Berger of University of Leuven in Belgium. He's still alive today. He's a classic academician and so on and so forth. But people forget about science. It's what the assumption he made during the time of his capability when he calculated. He essentially assumed some kind of circular perturbation. He doesn't even really account for the moon. Do you understand what I'm talking about, the problem? These yeah. people keep assuming, pounding their chest. I know this, I know that, okay? And they haven't checked the assumption. So in 2017, me and Sionso successfully published a very thick, <laughs> we always publish very thick paper. People don't want to read, but I have to tell you, please, it's good stuff. We can summarize, but the point is that we produce this whole data set. So far, I haven't made much advertisement because I don't get to talk. I don't have time to spread around. So even this one little work that I do, I would have to say it's enough to cover a lot of people's lifetime of work. So we produce this data set. They allow you to study because we include all the short-term perturbation. Do you understand what I mean by, by that? Uh, so we would be able to study ENSO problem, you know, short-term, few years into annual. We allow, this is what, when I say I want to study the problem, I study. See, this is what you call the boundary condition problem. So I started with that. In fact, that's what I'm saying. I have to go and erase all the old false stick picture. For, by the way, if the old calculation by Berger was to be already included, all this effect, my God, thank you very much. I don't have to do anything. I'm so grateful. But the problem is, it's not the best thing that we can do. And that's what we show again and again, that all this assumption, all the presumption by many of this so-called pretension, because you know what? They're hiding behind prestige and all that. Too bad that science is the only human endeavor. In fact, there are many more endeavors in life, like, like survival. You know, you go in the thing. It's not about how much theoretical talk you have and how much prestigious, how many gold medals you can put on your neck, how many Nobel prizes. Hey, excuse me, none of that matter. It's about what you can calculate, what assumption you make in your calculation, and let's talk about it. And so we produce this result. I really hope that someday people will do. In fact, IPCC doesn't include this thing. That's how you can say that. Of course, that's another matter. We already have so many fights. I have a lot more fight, by the way, about atmospheric physics. Those are a lot of harder problems, okay? And, and before I even go, I know you're interested in extinction. You guys are talking about all kinds of things like that. I want to uh, bring some awareness to you on one of the oldest classic problem that seems to be misunderstood a lot, which is having to do with the ozone layer. Yeah. I want to say this because I don't know. Have you heard this, uh, David? I don't want to make too much, but, but I felt that even, the, or even if you heard it, you let me say it because the audience may not heard it, so it will be beneficial for them to hear some. There are a lot of people say that, oh, you know, you have this big supernova and solar flares and all this stuff that come and then they destroy the ozone and then all of a sudden all the animals will die. But what they don't understand is that before you can say that, you need to understand another aspect of the problem. We know that ozone, 90% of the ozone stay in the stratosphere, which is somewhere from, I would say, 15 kilometers to, you know, 60. And then troposphere, 10% of the ozone. Ozone is back for your lung. That's no doubt. Yeah. But there is a very important understanding. This is why a lot of this CFC, stratospheric ozone destruction topic is also, it's also very sad. I, I want to say that because they always hear that, oh, humanity come along, 1987, we sing Kumbaya song, we forgot we are the world, and then we save the world. Because we stop producing CFC, 11 and 12. If you read in history, Please read in history. This is related to DuPont, knowing that their trademark or their copyright or whatever it is, is running out. So they have to find an alternative. So the UHFC, all these other things. These are not very good group. 
these are not very good uh, industry. They, they have to invent a story. But the problem of this CFC over and south can only be highlighted by a true understanding of the class of problem we're dealing with. So let me stop now by giving this long introduction. The bottom line is, let's take away hypothetically, and the point is that you can answer this question. You take out all the ozone from the earth, and you ask yourself, how long would it take for the ozone to come back if it come back at all? You know what I'm saying? This is a very good Gadekan experiment that Einstein is very fond of and that you can answer very confidently because we understand the chemistry and physics well enough. So would you care to speculate? How long would it take if we come back at all, David? I would say one solar cycle. I Eleven, say one solar cycle. 11 years. Yeah, too long. Too long, by the way. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, yeah, it's not even 10 years. It's not even one year. It's Ooh. 150 days. Wow. And I hope you see you, you, you see why I say this. Why is it so important to understand that? What this is understand to tell you is that don't focus on only the destructive part. Focus on the create the creation of ozone. The ozone is mainly produced by this so-called Chapman uh, uh, mechanism. But that is also not a very efficient way, by the way. But let's just take this standard paradigm. It's from O2 and uh, UV, solar UV, right? As long as the sun is not disappear, ozone is not quickly diffused away. Helium and, and, and hydrogen does diffuse away from our atmospheres, but very slowly. As long as they're not disappearing, you could never get rid of ozone. You have to well, remember, even they have all this destructive part from a supernova and all that. As long as you, let's say you destroy all of it, but it come back in 150 days. So the UV is not going to kill a lot of things, okay, in 150 days. That's the point. That's what I'm trying to say. Be alert. A lot of this false yeah. paradigm, this is including the famous Professor Avi Lok from, uh, well, from Harvard. He's a very smart guy. But he haven't even answered this question. I, I'm just not saying trying to show that I'm smart and all. No, no. I just simply want to know. I hate all this kind of superficial explanation, and then it becoming a myth. It's almost to the myth that people say, "Oh, ozone disappears, so therefore you can kill all these animals." No, no, not so easy. There, our, there must be other factors that we have to study. Our position, uh, Willie, is that um, mm -hmm. it, it has to do with the magnetic field. Uh, during these times of mass extinction, as a paleontologist, I mm -hmm. know. Most of them are lining up on these magnetic excursions, like the Lachamp back 42,000 years ago, mm -hmm. when the Neanderthal be, uh, right. went extinct. And if you look at the uh, biodiversity charts, uh, what you can come up with is a loose correlation that the, uh, when the magnetic field strength is less than 20%, you have speciation mm -hmm. events and you also have mass extinctions. Mm -hmm. So we infer that it's the cosmic rays coming in that kill off the biology or, and or create, right. create new biology. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand all that point of view, but, but all I want to illuminate is that your, 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 your time scale there is blow up. It's, it, the, the resolution is always key. That's the difference between geology and, and uh, factual, the one that much more detailed, but but which means your event has to be much more long lasting. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, if, as long as you are you're saying, okay, it's lasting for 10 years, of course, then all animals will die when you have no food to eat. You know what I'm saying? That's <laughs> fine. But the, don't go and say that you have one of these cat catastrophic things that's going to happen. No, no, I don't believe that for one day. <laughs> but the no. point is that ozone is very hard to destroy it. Because it doesn't matter what time in time period, because as long as we have some oxygen like 2 billion years ago, right, when we started to enrich the system, so that's why when I study wildfire history, I study all the way back to the amount of old, uh, oxygen required. You know what I mean? So it will be always fun to discuss all subject with you. I think for today, I think we're good enough, right, David? And oh I really God. enjoy this thing. And please spread the word. And then if you want me to talk about any other topic, we can speak about it other times. And uh, really appreciate your, 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 your hard work and, and, and your really, really sincere work to try to educate a lot of people. And I, I think we really need to network some more, spread some more, <laughs> tell yeah. more people. Yeah. And, but I, it's okay. I mean, I really couldn't care less. All I care is that, my God, is I've really been spending all this time studying. I might as well tell people what I know, what I don't know. But again, if I say anything wrong, please correct me. Right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. not asserting authority, but a lot of this careful question, like this ozone 150 days kind of recycling time, I figure it out all by myself. That's the kind of thing that I do. I mean, I don't, I don't follow people. I, I just think about the problem, but I felt because you know why? Ultimately, I want to study how the sun, solar, UV. You know what I mean? There's another theory about how 
the system, but now I'm in favor of just the visible radiation, you know, affecting the Earth system by tapping into just the ocean evaporation. They immediately produce all the effects that you needed, actually, in some sense. And then there's a lot more interesting aspect of this sun climate connection that, of course, it's a long story. There are many open, uh, open questions, for sure. And then, and but the point is that by now, just about, I am 99.99% sure that CO2 ain't gonna cut it. I'm very sorry for those, those kind of people who still want to live in that universe, this parallel universe who deny things. In fact, indeed, they are the denier. They are the climate change denier who. Yeah. Who keep insisting that CO2 can be can can drive all these things? I mean, it's just a bit strange. I mean, the kindest word I can use is yeah, it's a it's a strange world we live in, because these people who are supposed to understand science, and they chose not to understand science. They don't want to look at the evidence. They look at the thermometer record that is contaminated, and then they unwilling. They work very hard for 20, 30 years. So in some sense, I have to say that. I'm sorry, this is really man-made. They are worried about their reputation. They are worried about their soul. And these people keep saying we are the one that's selling our soul to the to the dollar coins and whatever it is. <laughs> and then they are the one that are unable to admit anything wrong they do. I mean, their lack of understanding is very obvious. Yes. Because they do not want to understand the problem. This is why the way IPCC has cheated all this long is the first thing they do is this. They tell you that all this temperature record, the first thing we must do is get rid of the seasonal cycle. So we study the deviation from the seasonal cycle. So you study the tiny change and they use the word anomalies. All this language is completely stolen from us. You know, word that is not quite correctly, you know, temperature. I don't quite sure what it mean, by the way. These people are constantly manipulating language, changing all the game, hurling inside, hurling uh, all this kind of confusion and, and do not want to understand how the season evolved. By the way, this is the biggest news I can give to IPCC and I hope your audience can appreciate it a little bit. <laughs> the, true, the true nature of understanding of Sun-Earth climate connection is actually just study the seasonal evolution of this thing for a thousand years, for a hundred thousand years, for a million years. That's it. Finish. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what it is. No two seasons are the same. No two winters are the same. No two summers are the same. No two fall are the same. All these orbits are constantly changing. Banjie, if you guys want to know more about the orbital solution, again, look up my work, right? With Sianso and all that. We have a new solution for the whole Holocene, right? And that kind of thing. Oh, the Ice Age problem, my God, I know that I want to get there, but it's so difficult because you have to work with the couple problem of the ice mass on the Earth and then changing the angular momentum of the Earth's spin itself. So that changes a lot of topic, okay? This is the kind of thing that I say you have to take things one, one step at a time. Science is not about, it's, a, it's not for rushing, it's not for showing your bare chest, you know, and pumping on it. No, 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 no. Calm down, boy. Gavin Schmidt, did you hear me? Go study. <laughs> I work very hard. I, I really, this is one thing I'm always very, confident of no one really can study as hard as this guy by myself. Oh, go ahead, maybe he's, he's studied more than me, but that's fine. But we the have... whole point is that I really work very hard to understand any incredible, incredible knowledge that I can share. Because when you speak, you should speak with some clarity or else you're just talking trash. You know I, what I'm saying? Absolutely. We appreciate you, Willie Soon. You're a legend, a living legend, and you have many, many decades of research ahead of you. And one of your favorite quotes, and I'd like to end tonight with it, is blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of the truth. And you certainly are a truther and a hero to science. Willie, on our next show, let's talk about how you discovered the missing sunspots from 1730 to 1760. And we'll also go over your grand solar minimum pr prediction, which extends all the way into 2050. How's that sound? Yeah, yeah, and then we try to we try we can do some some discussion on the most difficult problem, the origin of sunspot cycle, which which we all have worked on, everybody has worked on, and then I have to say that my current insight is is not very good, but is 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 adequate to discuss it in public because it, it's indeed it, it's it's really a very difficult class of problem. In, in fact, it is one of the oldest problem. Why do they have 11 year cycle? We don't know actually. We don't know. And many brilliant scientists from Robert Dickey, you guys know about Robert Dickey who measured this microwave background. 
I mean, many, many um, great, the greatest, uh, one of the great experimentalists of all time, you know, as good as uh, Rutherford. And those guys they have been working on this class. So this is a class of problem has been worked on by many, 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 many giants. This is why I'm very, very careful because I know we are always, a, I'm a tiny little guy, <laughs> tiny little sand that happens to appear on this beach area where people are walking on. I mean, all you hope is to be able to add a little knowledge. And my God, it, it's not about any pretentious thing. It is a true statement because it is a very complex subject. Our brain is probably not able to, to shed any more light if we don't calm ourselves down and look for the how nature is choosing to tell us the story. But of course, we work very hard to also look at other equivalent system and try to figure things out, big this and that. So yeah, it will be more illuminating if I shed light about my other works in sunlight stars, you know, all these other ideas to add a little understanding of sunspot activities uh, cycles. Yes, yes, yes. That would be a very fun conversation. Oh, awesome. All right, Willie, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your hectic day over there. And it's once again, it's not you, Willie. It's not CO2. It's the sun. And we'll see you all yes. soon. <laughs> all right. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. <laughs>